We are the UR Tennis Network. Our mission is to be the voice of tennis. We enlist a team of passionate enthusiasts to promote our sport. We strive to bring interesting perspectives on the many spins of tennis. Our goal is to provide the learners of our sport with current news and information from many angles. We seek active participation from communities interested in tennis, but tennis is not interested in them. We are expanding our outreach. Tennis is a true lifetime sport that needs to be talked about, and the UR Tennis Network pledges to pursue this idea relentlessly. Good afternoon and welcome to the Parenting Aces radio show. This is your host, Lisa Stone, and I am coming at you live from Delray Beach at the National Play Court, and I am with my guest today, Marlena Hall. Marlena is in charge of pretty much everything that has to do with this tournament and has been an incredible resource for me um, in terms of getting my son here and figuring everything out. So, Marlena, welcome and thank, thank you for you. doing the show. Thank you. No, this is amazing. I, uh, it's so funny that finally we, we touched base and we saw your son for a couple of years and here at uh, one of the biggest stages in junior tennis. Well, we're on kind of a weather way, a weather delay thing right now, which is all about weather for me and what well for my son because his match hopefully is going to be pushed back a few minutes, which means we can chat. Perfect. Um, but tell us a little bit about what it takes to pull off an event like this. You've got the boys 18s and 16s here. Yeah, it's, it's, a, you know, it's, it's a little mini pro event. I mean, we also put on the big pro event here in February. It's a 10-day and all the top uh, NCAA and uh, NAIA coaches that are coming down to recruit them. So this year, for the first time, there's a quality event, which mm-hmm. is what's going on today. Right. And um, to my listeners, the show is being pre-recorded on Thursday, so um, it's the first day of quality. Bring the opportunity that the USPA is it's our first time at the quality event. Uh, normally we started on Sunday and we go right into Maine, but now it's giving uh, junior tennis an opportunity to work their way into uh, a very tight and um, talented uh, player field. Uh, but you're, you're seeing a lot of kids are able to now play up and maybe would have been playing the 14s or if they're playing in the 18s and 16s and trying to get their, uh, their points into an, an older age division. So it's definitely challenging, but it, it affords more tennis working their way into I don't know if you had a chance to look, but I did write a couple of pieces on the process for this tournament this year. There's been so much confusion on the part of parents, even on the part of tournament staff. Um, I had the opportunity to talk to the tournament director for Kalamazoo, and he's facing the same stuff that you guys were facing yeah. in terms of trying to understand how the process works. What are the most common questions you've gotten, and how are you handling all that? Yeah, it's, I would be uh, definitely. Included at times, uh, you know, we're still figuring it out through the questions. There's a lot of cool emails. The U.S. will work with And, you know, we played, all of us are off we played quite on to this event before. It's still a little challenging to figure out the kind of logic because the, the main question that come up to deal with um, it says on one list I'm selected and I'm into the event, but on another list I'm not. Which list takes precedence and, and what determines. Uh, you know, which list has more merit. So, and, and there's there's a lot of confusion with that still. So we kind of just we defer to the U.S. and their, their list, and whatever that final national election list says, gains entry to our event. So definitely the question is to which list are most common. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I had massive confusion myself over that, <laughs> trying to figure out, okay, there's a dot next to my son's name. I don't know what that dot Wait, means. Wait, yeah, wait. is he in qualities? Is that? Certainly he's not in Maine. I know he didn't make our section quota. <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah. Um, but I did figure it out eventually. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so this morning, quality started. I know one of my son's buddies got a walk over in the first round. Another one played an on-site alternate, also from home. 
so it's kind of a crazy morning. Um, did you have a lot of on-site alternates, or is, yeah. did kids show up for that this year? Well, it's, a, it's a good question, and it's, it's interesting for us as well, because uh, now I think this is our, uh, our eighth year with this event, and we've never had, you know, normally when the question comes up before this event, which happens at every one of our junior events, we, we run nine big events in the country, and every question comes up as to, if I'm an on-site alternate, will I be able to get in? And a lot of times, depending what level of the event, there's a good chance. With this one, we usually answer that the likelihood isn't as high, because typically when kids are coming to a level one, the highest in the, you know, the country, you're booking your flights and your hotels and all those arrangements that you're making, usually the kids that are in, they're here. And it's very rare when you're the last minute pull out. This event's been very different because for a lot of the players that didn't get in to the main draw and they found out that they would have to make their way to qualifying and have more tennis, more hotel, more expensive, it became a lot of last minute changes to their schedule and therefore changes to our draw that I think our staff is working very hard to do. So this is the first year where, being that Florida is so dominant in tennis, uh, we've had a lot of local on site alternates to be able to work their way in. So it's been good for them, but a little bit more uh, work we've had to put in behind the scenes to try and form the draw because last, last minute changes. So, so far, I mean, we're in the first day. So far, what are you seeing that's different this year with the Folly event than in previous years? Well, with previous events, previous years with this tournament, we've never had the quality, so it's definitely brand new. Um, so we haven't seen anything that's different than another junior event that we've had. You know, a lot of these kids we've known since we've been running our 12th national to watch them grow up, and, and now they're towering over us. So we, we're, there's nothing that uh, it just feels like it's another junior event. It's just a longer version of the main draw is how it feels. The kids are all still extremely talented. Uh, as we know in tennis, on any given day, some of these qualifying players can beat somebody in the main draw on Sunday, but they just have to now play a couple more matches and take care of their bodies in order to get there. And I think that's the biggest challenge. I know coming, I mean, we live in Atlanta. Obviously, it's very hot and humid yeah. in the summer in Atlanta, too, but this puts that to shame. I mean, the air is so thick here, and um, we drove in yesterday in torrential rain, <laughs> which I mean, we get thunderstorms in Atlanta, too, but I I've, honestly have never seen anything like it. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting, I think, to watch these kids. I'm already seeing that the trainer is standing yeah. right next to us, and he's had some kids filing in already, and... Um, you know, I think the kids are starting to feel it even in round one, and it's pretty mild today. Yeah. Yes, it, it's it's such a, it's a topic that I it, it never gets old for me, and it's growing more and more each year. It's where I'm noticing from where we were years ago, uh, how early in the tournament you see the physicality, the weather conditions, uh, the, the preparation leading up to an event like this really come full force. And and Ivan Baird and I talked about it. You, Junior. He remembers this tournament vividly, and he, you know, even he's never seen anything like it. Where I've never seen so many bottles of Pedialyte and pickle juice and packets of, sh of salt, which are becoming like little treasures that people carry into their pocket, like their cell phone. It's it's a necessary uh, a commodity here when you see how these kids are. They know the heat. They know they're playing on clay. It's going to require a lot more physicality. They should hopefully, with their coaches and parents, are training two weeks minimum before coming here with their nutrition and, and, and with their, of course, their hydration. But when you come here, it's very important what you do before the match and what you do after the match. And if you if you fail to, to eat properly, if you fail to know how to cool off and recover when it's time to recover and not maybe go into the soccer field and play with your friends, just knowing how to conserve that energy is so important. I think the quality is going to be an interesting look on those that had to make their way into the main draw, how they can take care of their bodies on that Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, if they can make it that far, would be a real, real uh, nice thing to see. Yeah, I, I mean, talk about that some more, because I, I know um, I've written several pieces about hydrating and, and what's the right thing to take on the court to drink, and what's the right thing to have after you get off the court. But every kid's different, and not only are they having to take care of the nutrition and the hydration, but there's a stress level involved in competing at a national level like that, yeah. right? So what do you see with, with how that plays in? I, I, I've noticed in the past seven, eight years here that uh, every year there's a new, and I hate to use this word, a new trend uh, as to what's 
you know, what you've got to drink and what the best thing to eat is, and then it spreads like wildfire. I, I mean, two years ago, it was all about coconut water, and you still see coconut water. Uh, Pedialyte has seemed to be a very um, common trend. It's, you know, I, but then you'll read articles uh, where it says that you, you really just need a lot of water until you've extended it six hours worth of sweat. As, as, at that point, you read all these different things, and everyone they have, have the answer. But like I said, it's all a matter of personal. Whatever works for you. My brother will swear that salt packets and Pedialyte works for him when he's cramping this time of year. I've never gone the Pedialyte salt route, so it, it, it is completely personal. I, uh, I'm a big believer that uh, that free tournament preparation is critical, and a lot of times that that you know people will say to you, "I really didn't prepare," but a day or two before an event like this, it's it's not enough. It's, so it's really what you're doing those two weeks minimum before you get here, changing your diet. It's not just the hydration; it's really about the food, knowing when to eat, how often to eat. It's fuel. We, you know, they have to take care of their bodies if they're putting in six hours. Tennis a day, including warm up, including doubles and singles twice a day. It's, it's putting your body through so much is the only way to really take care of it. What you're all putting in. And the bio freeze of those topical ointments are, are supplementary, but it's, it's what you're putting into your body shouldn't be neglected. Yeah, great point. Great point. Well, let's switch gears a little bit. One of the cool things about the national level one for the 18s especially, has always been the opportunity to be seen by college coaches. Yeah. And the qualities, again, has put a little bit of a kink in that process because the kids are considered signed in to the tournament from the moment right. they sign in for quality. And so how has that impacted your ability to get the coaches here and, and the coaches' ability yeah. to interact? Yeah, it's um, I'm a college coach myself, so I... Uh, so it's, I can understand the difficulty from a coach's perspective and the player in the sense that you come down, you travel, uh, you make these arrangements so that you can have that one-on-one -on -one time. You know, a, a ranking and watching them play does, does a lot. It tells, it tells you their talent, which is a big part of your job when you're recruiting, but having that one-on-one -on -one time to get to know the player who you might be forming a coach and student relationship with is also really important. And not being able to speak with them here when they're in that state of, of stress, seeing how they handle those moments when you're, they're speaking with you. Um, you know, it, I think it's, uh, it does a little bit of a disservice to the coach and the player. But, uh, you know, in our past years, we've had a college expo on our, our, at our registration, which uh, I always look forward to running and seeing how they interact. And it's unfortunate that it's kind of uh, changed this year where there is no expo. It's really just the coaches coming down here. Usually they know who they're looking at. And a lot of the times the communications go on long before they get to this stage. So it's not uh, the end of the world by any means. But it does change the time frame of when they're speaking prior to taking center stage here at the Clay Award. I have seen a couple collegiate shirts here today. Yeah. So I, I, there are a couple co college coaches on site yeah. today. Um, are you expecting a lot more to come once the main draw starts? Or what are you hearing from the coaches? I Just going based on past years, we, we, a lot of the coaches were fortunate. They do come here because they love Delray Beach. They, you know, we, we, we have the same ones every year. They, they reach out to some of our staff. Uh, John and I tend to be foodies in town of Delray. And we'll tell them exactly uh, where to go. And they just they don't you know, get a rental car. They just walk down the avenue. Sometimes they come here to get away and enjoy their summer before their season kicks off in the fall. But uh, what, what has typically happened in the past years is we have a number of coaches that start in the beginning of the event. They stay here and they enjoy their time. A lot of schools like Florida State University, they uh, amazing coach there so that he's coming down towards the end. U.S. comes down towards the end. A lot of our local universities here will come and make their way in and out. Um, but we've expected in the past close between 50 and 100 uh, NCAA coaches that come in. So it's been consistent, which is nice to see some familiar faces. Uh, we're, so, yeah, we're expecting many more. Good, good. That's great to hear. Because I know, I mean, from our perspective, my son's entering his senior year of high school, so this is yeah, primo. Yeah, time. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, he sent the emails before we came down to let the coaches know he'd be here and that, you know, he's hoping to meet them and shake their hands and all of that. Um, he got some responses and some didn't bother to respond, but yeah. okay. this year is all the kids that got into the qualities are automatically entered into the doubles if they choose to be. Right. So they do have that opportunity to stick around once the main draw is in action, even right. if they don't make it through the qualities. 
my hope is that that will mean more coach interactions as well for those kids that, right. you know, to yeah. get in. Yeah, and, and the thing is, this time of year is tough because, um, you know, a lot of times you're waiting, like like your son's waiting for responses, and, you know, you're, you're, you don't want to be one of thousands that are trying to get into that coaching school. You want to be regarded as somebody that's uh, a, a strong candidate. And this time of year for coaches, they're getting so many emails from so many different people. They're running their own camps, and they're and they're they're trying to maintain the happiness and the retention factor of their existing students, so that they don't transfer elsewhere. There's so much on their plate that sometimes, uh, you know, the best way for them to communicate is to and, and again, it's a personal comment is not constantly follow up with them. Don't don't feel afraid that if you send out one email or one communication and they don't respond back immediately, that that means that you're not uh, high in priority. Sometimes they just need to know how interested you are. It's literally like in a, in a very funny way. It's like a relationship da- a dating game. They want to know that you're into them. You want to know that you're into that school and you want to wear that school's uniform. And I and I always encourage players don't don't be don't shy away. Follow up in a couple weeks and follow up with a phone call. Say, hey, I'm 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 a strong candidate for your school and. I really hope to, to meet you at, at the Hard and Play Court this year. So uh, I I, uh, I I would I hope that Double does do exactly what you say. I hope it affords more opportunities for communication, more chances to see them on court. Right, right. And uh, hopefully the coaches will watch the doubles. I know that's not usually a priority, but maybe this year, just because of the structure of the tournament, it will be a little more. I think that'll change. I think if you if you're following the trends and, and the rule changes, a lot of college tennis is doubles. Doubles is something that every college coach echoes. It's one of the most important um, uh, aspects of them winning and getting to the NCAA finals. So I think more than ever, I've seen coaches stick around to see how well these players are doing with their game and how comfortable they are at the net. Right, right. That's a great point. That's a great point. All right, so one thing that you've done that is facilitating the interaction with the college coaches is you have a player book. A, a, a real Facebook before the internet, um, a Facebook that that you can hold in your hand. Can you talk a little bit about the concept behind that and the reasons for it and how the players and the coaches use that book? Sure. I, in fact, I, I first I never got that question. I never had the opportunity to share. But the the, the the whole purpose of the player bio book for me, to be candid, was when I played, I just didn't think. To be honest, it was you know the little things that I think makes one of those little tiny. And nowadays with technology completely changing where you could figure out so much about these players just online, you know, there's, you have to, you, you've got to make things a little bit more interesting, I think. So from a term perspective, when I played it, was just a very black and white copy paste and uh, not exciting to read, much less exciting you know, to, to write about yourself. So we've shaped in the past couple of years, we've created a book that we wanted to add some color to uh, these players, show their personality. The, the, the ranking is just a number. Uh, who they've beaten uh, is just another stat on the paper. So this is just, it, it gives a little bit more of an all-encompassing uh, description of, of these players. Um, so we have about a little over 100 kids that every year, between 100 and 150 that are in the book. Uh, we talk about where they're looking to go to school and what they're looking to study. And of course, um, you know, the other, the other not the fun stuff about their SATs and um, their parents and what they, you know, what they, what they do when they're not on the tennis court. So it's just giving a little bit more um, room for them to show off who they are as not tennis players. Do you want to share some of the specific questions that you included this well, year? Well, my favorite one this year that I always try and do something new was, you know, I talked about the players if they had any superstitions, and any rituals, or sports that um, you know we know is so prevalent, and talked about with players like. Nadal and all the things that he does and talks about in his book openly. And I, you know, you see it. You know, us, we're such control freaks with tennis players and tennis players' parents, I'm sure. Yes. And it's nothing that we are, we're not proud of. And it's, it's, uh, as players, we have to try and take control of out of so many uh, uncontrolling uh, situations. So a lot of the players learn some very interesting things about what their rituals are, and not just the obvious with food and drink, but sometimes how often they they bounce the ball and why and when and how often they use the same ball and, and what their favorite lucky clothes or lucky undergarment. You really, really got. I had a good time reading some of these. I'll bet. I can only imagine what teenage boys are writing. I mean, I saw my sons when it you know we sat down and. And kind of did it together. I, you know, me kind of asking <laughs> lead questions as you tend to do. Okay, are you sure that we have that? That's one of the questions I really like that you asked that, that was actually 
actually very challenging for, for my kids to come up with this. And I'm going to first go to the bed. I'm going to leave it alone, okay? Really, I think you ought to go back to that. The question was, talk about something about you. And I I thought that was a great question. And yeah. I, I'm, I bet you're having a blast with that one, too. And I wow. can't wait to see the book. <laughs> but yeah. maybe you want to share a couple of your faves? Oh, well, I, I, I was pleased to see how many uh, uh, similar answers they were. I think I think that one was one that a lot of players did answer. Sometimes they won't answer what the most challenging aspect of the game is because they're afraid that that's soft by me. The coaches are the players. And it's really what I was trying to achieve there. But with as far as what you're going to bring to a team, I think you want to share with your what's going to become your extended family, and you want to share with you're going to become your, your mentor, your coach, and the coach wants to know how you're going to make the culture that they've spent you know, their, their blood, sweat, and tears into, how you're going to enhance it. We know that, of course, it's about winning. We, you know, it's, knowing that we'd all be fools if we disregarded that. But it's also about enhancing this culture of what you're going to do with this family, how you're going to bring your personality. And a lot of times the, the, the players will talk about their backgrounds, their culture, their, their, what their very unique experience they have through and how to add to some variety on the team and something new. And then you, you have a lot of the same comments that they're uh, they're, 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 they shout the loudest when, when uh, their high school team is playing and they can't wait to do that with their their current team. And any coach wants to know that. You don't want to have somebody silent in the corner. You want to, you want to you know, hurrah, hurrah. And uh, that was nice to see a lot of that, that comment spread around. What kind of feedback have you gotten in the past? How they do this. They, um, you know, they they will they, they will uh, show a lot of interest every year because they look forward to having something on the air the ride home, uh, the drive or the air ride, and, and uh, they they like to hold something in their hand and see where these kids are looking to go to school, uh, how soon, what they're looking to pursue, and get to know them again from that what they just see on the virtual paper. Um, you know, it's nice that they reach out they in advance. They explore and have a chance to put the book together. They're already putting in their mailing and billing information. So it's, that, and it, it's motivation for me to put in those hours to put it together. It's knowing that the interest is still there, uh, no matter how accessible the internet is to these coaches. I think we're going to scoop in a little bit because I'm More getting weather. rained on. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, so a little, a little forward movement here. Um, we really are live. Yeah, we are live. <laughs> And if I had video, you would see the palm trees blowing and the rain coming down. And thank goodness we're on clay, which means yes. quick turnaround after a rain. Yes. Um, okay. So, what else do you talk about? What are the challenges that you face as the media person, the communications person, the parent contact? Because <laughs> parenting issues is all about helping us as parents do a better job. What are some of the biggest challenges you face dealing with us, and what are some things you'd like to see us do better? Well, that's a, a loaded and amazing question. It is a loaded uh, question. Sorry to put you on the No, spot. no, it's fine. It's one of those things that you don't want to oversimplify because it's uh, something. I'm not a parent, so it's something that I have to be sensitive when I answer. Um, as far as the media and the press aspect of this event, you're really just trying to um, highlight these these players that are student athletes. Um, you know, you, it's an amazing uh, journey that these players have gone through from when they were seven years old, if not earlier or later, until now where they they become. We've had players like Jack Stock, who just as you saw won the Junior Wimbledon. Uh, and he won this event uh, years ago. Oh, he won the double. Jack. Double zero. <laughs> double one. Double double. Yeah, double. Correct. <laughs> Thank you. I told you I didn't have my my back. Yeah. But uh, you know, and we've had a lot actually come through here that go on to play our qualities and uh, the U.S. Open qualities event, and they're absolute gentlemen. Um, as you get to see them grow. This is this is my favorite tournament, my favorite junior event because I never. Uh, I don't have, we don't really have the issues. I say this now, it's during quality. Yeah. It hasn't really started yet. But uh, we have a nice, mature, respectful parents and players. From, uh, I think we're very lucky. Uh, a lot of the young divisions are not quite there yet. There's still a little bit of stress. Here, there's more ease. I think a lot of players want to put on a nice, mature performance for the coaches. So the challenge is 
challenges aren't uh, as stressful with some other junior events you run. I think what here is always do a better job of keeping uh, reality in perspective, uh, which is uh, such a silly thing for me to say. No, it's but, but what I what I mean by that is, you know, you, you, you run off the 12 rows, and as you know, this whole idea of playing professional, I think.
step you can take when it comes to tournament death, how you handle defeat, how you handle victory, it, it totally shapes who you are. But sometimes you just don't realize it until years later when you're looking back and you then start, you know, appreciating probably what your parents told you. Uh, but a lot of times, you know, even if you lost, the coach will remember you based on how you handled it and, and the heart that you left on the court. Uh, and the, and they'll, they'll notice when somebody that wins doesn't handle it like a gentleman or doesn't act like they learn from the win. Um, so it, it, it's, it's all about our behavior that I think is the lasting memory that our players and our and the coaches around us remember. So it's 100% of my opinion about the experience. Um, I, so much of what I do with my professional life now is all about what I learned through junior tennis. And uh, yeah, but that's why it, it, you get so much back. I'm very grateful for the experience that we have here. Well, expand on that. So much of what you do in your professional life came from what you learned in junior tennis. But there's many. It's an interrated show. Uh, but it's. Um, you know, when I, well, some things I'll do with my team is it doesn't matter if we lost at an event, we, I, it's very important that we go up to the tournament director before we leave to, to acknowledge them, shake their hands, say thank you for the event. Little things, because people remember that. Um, you know, knowing that you play with integrity, uh, you know, win or lose, you know, you, you, you didn't do anything to cheat yourself or others out of the integrity of the game. Um, putting And then putting in the work. You can't just want that instant gratification of the win to get the ball to the end and, and coin the turn of death that you uh, have you circle around your name. It, it's so much more about uh, the process of getting there, the work, the, the six, the, whatever, if it was an hour on the court or six hours, everything that you did that uh, led up to you wanting the success. You know, you don't get anywhere in the straw, you don't get anywhere professional. We all know this unless you really busted your push to to get there, and I think junior tennis teaches you that, that there's so much challenge around. On any given day, somebody can have a better serve than you. One gust of wind can, you know, sometimes change an emotion. Um, so it's, you know, it's a familiar pro uh, uh, phrase that we hear from a lot of the, uh, the world's best coaches, is staying in the moment and, and appreciating every moment out there without fast-forwarding and rewinding. Um, and that's so true in professional life. It's not getting ahead of yourself. It's not those regrets. It's just keep pushing ahead. Well, you found a way to stay in the world of tennis professionally, which is so cool. And I think one of the things that I try to share with, with the Canadian community is Having a career in tennis doesn't just mean being on the court and hitting yellow balls. Yes. There are a lot. Well, but it, I People mean, think that. <laughs> they do think that. And there's so many amazing ways to stay involved in the game without being a player. So you are running this, the media and public relations for this tournament. You're also a college coach. Talk about how you marry those two things and why you decided to take that path instead of any other any path. Other. Yeah. Uh, it's, they, they're all very um, similar uh, beings in, in a strange way because at the end of it, it's all about you want to give back and, and, and help a player. Um, that's really the core of this. I had the fortunate that when I uh, was interning uh, through college that uh, Ivan Barron and his family gave me an opportunity to intern here and it was I, I was a year or two after I finished play court myself, so it was very familiar this process, and it was um, it's very um, surreal to be on the other end of the deck. You know, it's one thing to be the player and you approach, and quite another is put on these events, from the pro tournaments that we do to the junior level events, and then of course the college circuit. So all along the way, you're just trying to use tennis as a means to talk to these players, and, and you can relate to what they're going through and, and, and when they're going through puberty. And, why you want to stay involved with the sport, but it's so much about what you're doing with the community, and it's so much about what you do for, for these kids that when they get to 20, 30 years old, you know, I, you can almost spot a, a, a student athlete when, when, they're, when they're in the boardroom, and, see, and, and there's a certain, like, silent bond that we have. Um, so, it, it, no, you're not on the court every day, I am with my college kids, but it's it's 100% about creating this atmosphere and making sure that we preserve what this sport is supposed to be doing for these players. 
There's a lot of discontent, I would say, right now in the junior tennis world, um, especially right now with, with the latest changes with the clay course and hard course and the selection process and all the confusion over it. And one of the things that I find really challenging is to try to maintain my love of the game and to share that and to continue to encourage people to get their children involved in the game because of all the gifts that give back. But at the same time, to advocate for change in a positive way more the game itself, and not only are we seeing it in the juniors, we're seeing all these changes happen at the collegiate level. How do you personally handle that kind of back and forth of, you know, you lo obviously love the game more than anything, but there have to be some things going on that you, you kind of scratch your head and say, wait, wait, what are they doing? <laughs> yeah, I usually get pretty opinionated. Um, I've known for it a little bit with my uh, with with my press releases, so I probably won't be um, uh, completely silent with that when, I, when I'm writing. But I I think it's a very tough question you ask because um, you have to try and remember every day when these things are happening why you do what you do and why when you were seven why did you decide to get a brack and what 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 how it changed you. You have to remember that or else you do lose sight of it and you do fall victim to the, 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 the indoctrination of what's going on with uh, your sport around you. Um, I'm, I, I I just wish, no matter what they're doing, that they can keep in mind, even though it's a business, and, and even though it's, a, it's, a, it's an organization that prides itself on uh, a great thing, just keeping in mind that uh, we need to develop players, and that should be the focus. That's, if that is the tagline, uh, then that should be the number one focus. And as long as we're striving to really develop and, and help these, these these people become better tennis players, um, then I think we'll be doing okay in the long run. It it does make me frustrated at times. I would you know I would lie and say that it doesn't. Uh, from a tennis organization aspect, you want your draws to be full and you want to give and afford so many kids the opportunity to play and when the draws are cut shorter and the tournaments on the tournament calendar are less then the, you know of course it, it affects more people than, than you might realize um, but I, I can only hope that these are the bump in the road and hope that uh, change is on the horizon and hopefully we'll get back to what what the whole purpose of this institution is about is to find players with talent and they'll make them as good people, the best people they can be. You know, the tennis player is second and the person is first. So I, I don't know what's going to happen. It changes every day. It changes every year. But I, you know, I'm hopeful that um, it's enough. Uh, contributors that are that have that have influence make enough uh, of, a, of, a, of a say about it. Maybe yeah. the change will will be coming soon. <laughs> one thing I have to, to commend you on, and one thing in particular is um, my son played his first round college match this morning. They split set. They played a full third set. <laughs> it's the first time in a very long time that he's played a full third set. And I think it's awesome that y'all preserve that for even for the quality because I truly was expecting that qualities I would play a ten point breaker in the of a third set. Yeah, it's and it's it's strange because you hear both sides from different parents at times and then because they know it's such a long event, they want to abbreviate the, the score so that you can again preserve their their, their, their bodies. But you know, for me, I, I you know I don't like when doubles is cut in eight game process. I don't like when there are no ad scoring. For me, I know that this again is another um, subjective opinion. But uh, I I believe that you should allow these players to play the full duration of the match, especially at this level, because again the talent is enormous. On any given day, something can change, and the, you know there's there's no reason, in my opinion, because there's no there's no there's no uh, other impending uh, issues that would say we need to abbreviate this to a 10 point I let, let them play and let the victors come out at the end so it's nice that our tournament and the USA allows us to do that um, you know I, I hope it just stays that way across the board and we incorporate doubles into that strategy as well that would be nice so are the, will the doubles be 
two out of three, or there'll be a game pro set. You know? I, I think I think we'll, it'll be a question for the, for the tournament director okay. as, as we go along, trying to get the the matches in with the, the weather right. and with the, the duration of the event. Okay, that's that, that was a very political answer. <laughs> Well, we're coming down to our last few minutes, and I think my son's actually going back on court shortly, so um, I'm going to try and wrap this up. What else do we need to know about the National Play Court, and what goes into making this event? How far in advance do you guys start working on this? And I think we, 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 start, we do start working on it uh, just about when the past year's event ends. So we go to the web, we change it, we go to the dates, we go to the USDA throughout the year. I know Ivan Barron worked extremely hard for the USDA to put on, you know, we believe is one of our uh, best tournaments in the country. Um, for us, it's really about, as we all have played, it's about communicating as much information as we can to the parents. We know how much stress is on this event. We know how, many, how much uh, financial expenditures there are at stake. Uh, we know what's at stake. So for, for our end, we just want to be as uh, upfront and informed through our website, through the office, uh, as much as we possibly can. We're, we're people. You know, if you say to us, we need a little bit more time before a match, you know, I'm dying. I just played five hours. Uh, you know, we we like to think that we work with you. We're not trying to um, we're not we're, we're trying to make sure that we keep everything fair across the board. But at the same time, we want these players to be able to you know perform. They got this far. It's not uh, it's not that it's over after this. But you know, for, for all sense of purposes, this after junior tennis is this is a pinnacle. So we're just trying to do everything we can, having the best sites that we think are in the country, unbelievable facilities that we're so gracious to have. We, so if we can make it as pushy as possible, then, then the kids are going to do all the work. And, and it's, you know, really, the the, uh, the accolades really belong to the parents. They really do, because you, you sacrifice pretty much your entire adult. I, I look back and I wonder, you know, now that I take my college team, I look back at my parents going, oh, how do you do that? I, you know, I paid back and forth. I mean, you know, you, you have to plan every the rental car, the hotels, and you, you can put your life on hold so that your children, so to speak, can have, you know, these experiences. And uh, you know, we're just we're just proud to sit back. Our our job is easy from here. It's really what the parents and players do at this point. We just we look forward to seeing what they do in college and or if they pursue any professional endeavors. We just so we hope that we, we stay involved. That's very cool. And I, I have to correct you on one point. You said that parents put their lives on hold. A friend of mine just pointed out to me and and well in another interview that this is our life. It's not that we're putting our life on hold. It's that we're choosing you know to to go down this path with our children because it's such an awesome experience to have with them. And I think, you know, if more of us as parents can look at it that way, that it's not it's not giving up something, it's creating an opportunity to spend time with your child and and I recently wrote an article this July March, the first month of my son's last year in junior tennis. And you know, there's a lot I'm gonna miss. There's a lot I'm not gonna miss. I I won't lie, but you know, there are very few things in life that afford you the opportunity to have the intense time one on one with your child, yeah. like junior tennis does. Yeah. And, you know, you're not traveling with a team, it's just you and your kid, and you, you have those long car rides, and you have the nights in the hotel room to yeah. kind of debrief and catch up. And, and you know, I think it's, it's really important that we look at it that way. And, and I'm you would hope you have that attitude too. You I wouldn't do. trade it for anything. Too, but yeah. it's still, nonetheless, it's, it's it's pretty amazing how much it's sacrificed all around. Sure. And uh, you're, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade for anything. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I know you've got tons of work to do. I'm going to make sure my son is hydrating, hydrating. and eating <laughs> properly and has everything he needs before his next match. And uh, yeah. I just, I'm just i looking forward to the rest of the weekend. Yeah. And yeah. hopefully we'll still be here on Monday. But in case we're yeah. not, at least we've got the interview done. And, and my listeners will have the opportunity to hear it. Great. Well, thank you so thank much you. for having us. Thank you. All right. And to my listeners, hope you enjoyed this. And uh, stay tuned to ParentingAces.com. And we got lots more great stuff coming. Hopefully I'll still be in Delray on Monday, but if I'm not, uh, you'll know that too by just following us on Twitter and Facebook and following us on ParentingAces.com. Have a great week, everybody.